Erica, would you mind reading a page or two from your book? Oh, I just so happen to have it on my lap right here. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> I would be happy to. I'm like, I'm like a teacher. This is chapter 16. It's called Own Your Power. Okay. Your dream comes from the most powerful place, you. It's born from divine inspiration, one of the most powerful forces in the universe. This calling becomes a burning desire, one that gives you ambition, perseverance, drive, and even compassion in a way you've never felt before. It helps form the most powerful version of you there ever was. And yet, the moment it becomes an impossible feat you have to achieve, the power is immediately stripped away. It's your superpower and kryptonite all in one. But the stripping of your power is really an illusion. It's a choice to give it away and a choice you don't have to make. Instead of feeling at the mercy of others to make your dream come true, you can take your power back by realizing, as Abraham Hicks says, they are all just pawns in the law of attraction game. You get to control so much more than you think. You get to control your energy, your vibration, your beliefs, your strategy, your actions, your risks and asks, and the most important of them all, you get to create your reality. All of those things combined with the belief in abundance and limitless opportunities leads to a world where it doesn't matter if someone says yes or no to you. The dream is happening no matter what. I think one of my superpowers is reminding people how powerful they really are. That shift in energy can be all it takes to manifest exciting new opportunities. Because how you show up to the world is how the world will show up for you. Whatever you believe will be reflected back to you. If you feel powerless in your dream pursuit, you will have experiences that confirm those feelings and vice versa. P.S. Owning your power is so much more fun, so let's choose that, shall we? Let me help you by busting the power myths that your subconscious is fighting for. Here is one of the power myths. Gatekeepers. Gatekeepers are like the bouncers of the club deciding who gets in. It feels like they have all the power and artists are at the mercy of their decision. Actors are at the mercy of casting directors. Authors are at the mercy of publishers. Startups are at the mercy of investors. It feels like these gatekeepers are in charge of our fate and we have no control over what they say. Access to our dreams is in their hands. So how are we supposed to feel powerful in those moments? We hold none of the power in those decisions. Clap. <laughs> That's me waking you up from the hypnotic spell you're under. Time for the powerful truth. Powerful truth. These gatekeepers do not determine your fate. Only you can do that. Pillar number seven says that your success is inevitable, which means your fate has already been decided. Any single gatekeeper or any single opportunity will not break your chances of succeeding. It's already been decided. Your success is a done deal. Who cares what the gatekeeper says? Your person is coming. Your opportunity is coming because it's inevitable. And if that's the case, what if these gatekeepers were in fact allies? What if they were friends? What if they were your support system, your cheer squad? What if the universe always placed people on your path to help you? And what if that help didn't always come in the pretty package you want? A no could be just as much a gift as a yes. When Jack Canfield's book was turned down 144 times by publishers, what if that was all a gift because the publisher he was meant to work with happened to be the 145th? What if it's all working out perfectly? 
We tend to put gatekeepers on pedestals because we think they hold the power. But you hold the power. Take them down from that pedestal. They are just people. They are pawns in your game. And this game is in the highest good of everyone. You know the value you bring. You know you were meant to do this, so it can't not work out. If this gatekeeper doesn't let you in, it says nothing about your potential. It says nothing about your future or your ability to succeed. It just wasn't a match. But I promise you, your people are out there. Keep going because they're looking for you too. Excellent. <laughs> That's just two pages. Why did you choose that passage? Well, one, because I think that it's something a lot of people struggle with. I think that so many filmmakers feel powerless in this industry and they are constantly searching for ways to feel powerful. That's why a lot of people do their own work, you know, film their own projects because they want to feel in control and they feel like everything's out of control. So I wanted to read that to address that you know, exact thing. I think that there's so many ways that we can feel, you know, be in our own power without it even having to be something as literal as filming your own content. Um, and also because so many people have read the beginning of the book, the first chapter, and I think a lot of what we talked about today was stories from the first couple chapters. And so I wanted to share something from the back of the book, the, the third section, um, that to me feels like th this is how a high achiever thinks. You know, a high achiever doesn't feel at the mercy of gatekeepers. They feel that they have the power to create whatever they want. And if something doesn't work out or doesn't happen the way they wanted it to, that's okay. It doesn't mean that it, it's not still going to happen. And how did you feel writing that chapter? Did it, did, were you sort of empowered? I mean, as you're writing it, were you almost transformed into another world? Or? Yeah, I mean, everything I wrote, I need to hear over and over again. You know, I read my own book a lot. <laughs> and I'm not trying to say that in like a super arrogant way, but in a way of like, I needed to hear this again today, you know? Um, yeah, I really feel like I, I mean, so much of the book came from working with my clients and the work that we've done over several years now. Um, but I do feel like I sort of, I don't want to say channeled, you know, but I, I just feel like it it came from a place like I I felt like this was this idea to write this book was divinely sent to me. Like I just I just got the idea. It wasn't something I strategize. I didn't strategize and say, oh, I should write a book. I was like, I just felt this feeling of like you have like you have to get this message out to help people, you know. And then when COVID hit, not to be super morbid, I was like, I have to get this message out before I die. What if I get COVID and die? Like, I was really feeling like I need to finish this book. I told my mom where like my book files were on my computer. I, oh. I was just a little fearful during, you know, dur like during this pandemic. Um, but yeah, I just, I don't know. I just, I really want more people to, to hear this message and hopefully it will help transform, you know, their careers. When you tell your clients this message, are they resistant at first? Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, yes and no, and, and myself as well. You know, I, I share this story with my clients a lot when I was first starting out, you know, really embracing some of this for myself. I was working with a life coach and we were talking about money, abundance in, in terms of money. And I was really struggling financially that month. And I said, I'm so broke, I'm so broke. I really need a haircut. I can't afford a haircut. I can't afford anything. And she said, Erica, you are an abundant person. You are so abundant. You have access to money all around you. And I said, do you want to look at my bank account? I have hardly any money in it. And I went back and forth with her arguing about how broke I was. No, you don't understand. You need to hear me. I am broke. I am struggling. I need to be heard. And my poor coach, she, she was so patient and kind with me, you know, because I had so much resistance. And now, of course, looking back, I, I share that story because 
when I look back now, I can see like I was really fighting for my limitations. I was fighting to stay where I was. I, I wasn't listening to her when she was, you know, like it's like if I listened to her, like I there I could have been open to solutions. With the like with the FedEx logo, right? I, there could have been solutions in front of me that I didn't see because I didn't want to see them. I wanted to instead prove how broke I was. So I myself have been resistant and um, I've definitely had clients be resistant, especially in terms of not, not really necessarily the belief, but the action that it should then lead to. So for example, like one time I worked with a client who I was like, you need to change your day job because her day job had her traveling a lot. And she would travel for like at least one week every month. So she was out of town a lot. And I was like, you want to audition, and this was pre-pandemic, you know, nothing was self tape You want to audition and, and, you know, get representation and audition and, and books work. You're not even here to do it. This day job, I understand that it's supporting you, but you need a different day job that's going to support what you're actually trying to do because right now it's blocking you. And it took her, I think like six weeks, I mean, it took her weeks, you know, because that's a scary thing, you know, that's definitely a risk, but you know, working through the mindset of it, of like believing that your success is inevitable. If you take this risk, A, you, you start to believe, of course there's another day job out there for me. Of course I can believe that that's possible, that I can be financially supported in a day job that also gives me time to audition, you know, and stay in LA at least and not be traveling, right? It's like you have to start to believe that things can work out for you, even with these little things of, I have to believe not only that my success is inevitable, but that I can find a different day job. I have to believe that I can be financially supported. You know, you have, so we worked through, you know, shifting her beliefs and eventually she came around, changed her day job, got an agent right away, booked her first co-star, booked a lead in a TV movie, you know? So, so things really shifted for her, but you know, it's okay to have resist. It's okay that it takes time. I think as long as you're open to doing the work, it doesn't have to happen overnight. But if you're, if you're open to doing that work, I think then that's, that's where the benefit will be. When you had the, the down period after you had moved out here, got this great job, and then the recession hit, or it was already in, in mm -hmm. motion, and I believe then the show was canceled, mm -hmm. I guess. Were you fighting for your limitations oh, during that time? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, yes, I really was. And again, it goes back to, you know, I had those like blinders on of only seeing the problem and not allowing myself to open up to solutions. I didn't do nothing. Like, I, I you know, I'm an ambitious person and I... I tried, you know, I put myself out there. I think I cold emailed a bunch of people. I, I tried to get another job. So it's not like I didn't do anything, but I had those blinders on and I was definitely like, you know, it's like if my mom suggested like, oh, you should, you could go for a drive or go down to the ocean. No, mom, I can't do that. That means I have to put gas in the car and I can't afford gas, you know? So it was like, I was constantly focused on the problem. Um, and fighting to stay there essentially. You know, my mom was like trying to tell me all these things that could potentially help me. And it took me a long time to get to a place where I stopped fighting for my limitations and I finally opened myself up to help. 